Prayer is a privilege that we get to experience daily. Prayer is not a responsibility that we get to do. Hi there church and welcome to our new series of devotional based out of Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 to 20. Yes, the Great Commission. You know, this is what it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of age. You know, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you is what this series of devotional is based on or is all about. You know, this devotional series that we have been doing and will continue to do in our church is to encourage spiritual growth, to serve as a discipleship tool, to obey God in everything that God has commanded us, catering for individuals, groups, and families right here in Reservoir Garden Baptist Church. You know, since Jesus Christ and His saving work formed the foundation of our faith, we, are, we all here should be most concerned about knowing how to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know, 2 Peter 3.18 says there, you know, our growth in the grace of Christ will be com commensurate with our use of the means God has appointed for us to use. You know, theologians refer to this as means of grace, media gratia. You know, the means of grace are God's appointed instruments by which the Holy Spirit enables believers to receive Christ and the benefit of redemption that He offers. You know, although God could have chosen to reveal Christ immediately to His people, He has determined instead to do so through certain means. You know, God assigned the Word, the Lord's Supper, ministries, serving, prayer, you know, to be the foremost means by which we communicate, which He communicates Christ and His benefits to believers. You know, today we'll be looking at one of those important means of grace, and that is called prayer. You know, uh, F. B. Mayer, the author of the book uh, entitled The Secret of Guidance, said this in his book, The great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer. The great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but is unoffered prayer. Wow! You know, the great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. You know, instead of it being something we do, you know, instead prayer, you know, prayer instead of it being something we do every day, like breathing, eating and walking and talking, prayer it seems to have become like that of a little glass covered box beside the bomba, you know, pipes that we have here uh, in our sanctuary. Okay, on the wall, right, that says, break in case of emergency. You know, it is true that so very often we associate prayer with crisis in our life or God meeting our needs that we have in our life. You know, prayer is, for the most part, is an untapped resource in many Christians' lives an unexplored continent where untold treasure remains to be unearthed or discovered. You know, prayer it is talked about more than anything else and practiced less than anything else in the Christian life. And yet, for the believer, it remains one of the greatest gifts our God, our Father has given us outside of salvation. Church, today, let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to 39. And this is what it says. Very, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companion went to look for him and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. And that is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Wow, church. From this passage above, 
we can see that Jesus was committed to being one with the Father. Theologically speaking, He is one with the Father, but during His time on this earth, as the incarnate Son of God, He needed to pray just like any other Christian, just like you and me would today. You know, the Bible says in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 7, that Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. Church, this is the doctrine of incarnation. You know, as one born in the likeness of man, having emptied himself and let go of equality with God, Jesus relied on the same resources as all men must rely upon. Jesus, he needed air, food, water, sleep, and prayer. Church, with all of this in mind, here are four observations about Jesus' prayer life to inspire gratitude in our own life for His example of prayerfulness that we should follow in. Amen? And that's what we want to look at. Firstly, we can see that from this particular passage in verse 35, Jesus prayed early. Church, what did Jesus do very early in the morning? What did Jesus do very early in the morning? You know, the Bible says very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus' time of prayer was very early in the morning. Uh, that is, could be during the fourth watch of the night between 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. You know, the, word, the, the term pray indicates here prolonged prayer rather than a minute-like prayer. Jesus spent time in praying. You know, he spent time yet before the sun rose. We find him in the morning communing with the Father in prayer. You know, Jesus did this by starting his day with prayer. Can you imagine that? Jesus did this by starting his day with prayer. The question is, why? Why? Why he started his day with prayer? It is because to start your day with God establishes a proper perspective on that day. When you start your day with God, establishes a proper perspective on that day. It is a great time for us to begin with a clean mindset and focus our attention on God the Father and be mindful of the mission and depend on God for strength. See, Jesus rose early, quietly getting dressed, tiptoeing out of the house, walking silently through the streets of Capernaum and climbing a hill outside of the town where he could spend his quiet time of prayer before his Father in heaven. I want you to remember, church, that Jesus was a man and such an early morning was no easier on him than it is for us. He had no alarm, no lights, no coffee to help him. But he still got up early to pray. This is especially impressive in light of his previous day and what happened on that night. Let me give you a summary of what happened. He traveled to Capernaum, taught in the synagogue, confronted a man with an evil spirit. Then he went to Peter's home for dinner, healed Peter's mother-in-law, and after sunset, that evening at sundown, the whole town gathered at the door where Jesus was and they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. That was his day before. The morning he got up to pray. Imagine whatever you were doing at sundown last night. The doorbell rings. You open the door to find every sick and demon-possessed people in the city crying out to you for help. This was Jesus' evening. He was in essence the sole doctor at the emergency room. He likely worked for hours listening to, touching and healing people from all variety of illness and injuries and while dealing with demon-possessed people who were shrieking and shouting at him. You can bet it was a long, laborious, tired, exhausting night for Jesus. After this long night of hard work, Jesus, the Bible says, rose very early 
in the morning to pray, probably about 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Church, perhaps we should consider forsaking some sleep to gain some prayer time. <laughs> After all, which is better, to be well rested but prayerless or to be tired and to be prayerful? Church, I want to ask you right now, do you have a daily quiet time with God? Do you have? I hope so. Maybe you have it early in the morning or maybe before you go to bed. Maybe you do both. If you have the option, morning may be the best time since it prepares you for the day ahead. What you read and pray with the Father in the morning may be exactly what you need as you face a trial, a temptation, a decision, an obstacle or even an opportunity during the day. Jesus knew the importance of prayer for revitalizing himself and for staying on mission that God had for him. After a busy evening of healing, the most likely, he, most likely he went late into the night, the ministry that he did. But the Bible says this, Jesus got up early to pray, for he needed the strengthening of prayer and time with his father more than the sleep he needed for himself. He also needed the solitude of prayer, away from those in need, including his disciples. This leads me to the second point. Not only Jesus prayed early in the morning, Jesus prayed alone. You know, the Bible says, and rising early, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Wow. He went to a desolate place, a solitary place, where he prayed. Church, the emphasis is on solitude. He went out to an unpopulated place to pray. Remember, he was staying in Simon's house. He must have tiptoed out because he, uh, you know, they, the Bible says they didn't know where to find him. They didn't know where, what happened to Jesus. They didn't know where did Jesus go. He left no note. He had no smartphone. He didn't leave a WhatsApp message. He could, uh, you know, he could receive no texts, emails or calls. He was far enough away from Simon and the others that the Bible says they had to search for him. Simon and his companions went to look for him. He was practically hiding somewhere. <laughs> you know, the word translated here as solitary is the same word translated as wilderness in the book of Mark chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, 12 and 13 of the first chapter that we are reading. You know, there was no true wilderness near Capernaum where Jesus was, but Jesus went apart to a place where he could be alone with his thoughts and with his Father in prayer without distraction from people or without worldly distractions to distract him, to be attracted to his Father. So we can see that there is an obvious connection between praying early and praying in solitude. Solitude is necessary for our focus. You see, church, we are living in a society where people prefer noise, environment, with internet, TV, and sports. The kids are crying, and telephone is ringing consist consistently, uh, and the demands of our job drives us up the roof. Church, you and I must get alone. Get out if necessary. If you simply cannot rise before the distraction begins in your life or in your home, Find a solitary place where you can go early in the day. You know, maybe it may be a spot in your living room, you know, or it may be a spot where you pull your car off the road on the way to work to commune with God as the traffic passes by. Maybe it will be a quiet room at work before it begins. You know, especially for housewife and mother who felt who feel like solitude is impossible for you because you've got children around you to take care of them. You know, before they wake, you got to wake, you got to prepare for your husband, you got to prepare for your children. It is good that you find before everybody else wake up and before you wake up and do what you need to do. Every day, you wake up and find a place where you can pour your heart to God before the day begins. You know, solitude is the only way to engage in prayer with the intensity that it deserves. Wow. You know, confession, thanksgiving, and petition can be done without any distraction. It requires solitude. The third point is this, Jesus prayed under pressure. 
Not only he woke up early to pray, not only he prayed in solitude, he prayed under pressure. See, the Bible says this, And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Everyone is looking for you. Can you imagine the pressure that Jesus was having? Everyone is looking for you. You know, if you are like most people, you and I are under intense pressure, especially in this season of COVID. For the past one and a half years working from home, you know, children are not going to school, they are at home. You have to take care of them while you work and responsibility, cook, this and that. Oh, wow. Pressure, intense pressure to say the least. You know what, church? Jesus can relate. Jesus can relate to the intense pressure that we have in our lives. You know, the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is very, who, but the one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. See, Jesus was under the pressure. What pressure? Pressure of fame. Mark chapter 1 verse 28 says this, And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. See, the pressure of fame has destroyed many people. And Jesus also felt it. He was under the pressure of demands of people. Everyone is looking for you. He had an entire city of needy people searching for him because he was the only one who could help them. He was under the pressure of compassion. You know, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says this, when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion for them. Wow. Under all this pressure, Jesus made the time and took the time and took the effort to do what? To pray. Wow. You know, he could have gotten up before sunrise and started healing people, but he didn't. Instead, he prayed. He prayed. You know, it reminds me of Martin Luther and a quote that was accredited to him. You know, after being asked about his plans for the next day, this is how Martin Luther responded to that question. Work, work, work. From morning till night. Work, work, work. In fact, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours of the day in prayer. I have so much to do the first three hours in prayer. Church, let's stop letting the pressure destroy our prayer life. Let's stop busyness of life to destroy our prayer life. Church, let's stop blaming responsibility of life and let it destroy our prayer life. Instead, let the pressure trigger prayer in our lives. Let responsibility trigger prayer in our lives. Let the busyness of life trigger prayer in our lives. The more pressure, the more responsibility, the more busy, the more prayer is needed in our lives. Wow. You know, when the disciples woke up, they discovered that Jesus was not there. The Bible says they went out looking for Jesus. In fact, there was an uh, all points bulletin out, you know, on Jesus. And they were telling everybody, hey, look out for Jesus. And the whole village, the whole town, the whole city began to look for him. All were looking for him because the disciples were looking for him and they could not find Jesus in their home. <laughs> the last time they saw, he was sleeping beside them and they woke up, he was gone. They were looking, where is this miracle worker man went to, gone to? The word, you know, the word went to look for, okay, carries the implication that they were agitated, frantic, searching for Jesus. It's not some casual stroke down the road looking for Jesus. They were frantically agitated, searching for Jesus. It's just like a parent who lost their kid in the shopping mall. They don't know where their kid went to. That's the feeling. And that was how they were experiencing. That's how they were looking for Jesus, shouting the name of Jesus up in every alley, every valley. Every nook 
and crannies, they were looking for Jesus. They were looking for Jesus. They were desperate for Jesus. They were, they were hunting down Jesus. The question is this, why did the disciples look for Jesus? What might they have expected from him? You know, the Bible says, verse 36, 37, Simon and his companions went out to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. You know, Simon and his companion or disciples went to look for Jesus. They even hunt down Jesus eagerly due to people's demand to find Jesus. You know, the author, Mark, pointed out that Peter was doing this as his leadership role. You know, no doubt, though he had good intention, I will find Jesus and get him back on track. You know, he, he need a good manager like me to really prepare his timetable and schedules and time. Does he know that he needs to heal people? People are looking for him. He needs God to help them. And as a good manager, I'm the only one who can manage Jesus. But unfortunately, his intention will turn out to be inappropriate. Peter found Jesus and declared. In other words, he exclaimed. The word exclaimed there is he shouted <laughs> angrily. Okay? He shouted to Jesus. People are looking for you. Why you go missing? Where have you gone? Peter exclaimed. Wow. Another way of saying in our lingo is, Jesus, what's wrong with you? Jesus, what are you doing? Jesus, what are you thinking? That could be in our language, what Peter told Jesus. You see, ministry potential is blooming after the performance of last night that Jesus did in that town. And Peter told Jesus, you need to come and work the crowd. You need to build on our success that we had yesterday night. See, that's how probably he was thinking. You know, crowds gathered to him, but Jesus knew that this was not a mark of success. Peter became a distraction or a stumbling block for Jesus through ministry. You know, sometimes distraction comes from the people and from within, inside the circle of Jesus' disciples like Simon, you know, became a distraction for what Jesus had to do. You know, the Bible says later Simon became a stumbling block to Jesus who was determined, all right, to take the cross boldly. Remember, he denied. Remember, he told God, you know, I will stand in the way, I will defend you. I will put my life on the line. You are not going to go to the cross. You know, Simon chose to take the easy way by riding the tide of popularity rather than path of suffering and the cross. You see, people do not change easily. I believe this is what is taking place in, this, in the passage as we read as well. But Jesus prayed. With all these things that is coming against him, he prayed. He prayed to resist the pressure of so-called success and led his disciples, including Peter, in the right direction. See, Jesus prayed to remain focused on the task he came to accomplish. He prayed for the mission to be accomplished in God's way, not the way of public opinion that seems to be attractive because it was deceptive. Simply, he prayed because ministry itself that he was doing is difficult. Church, life is hard and we all have to make choices. How will I honour God? How will I serve God? How, or how will I keep the main thing the main thing in my life? How can I do this without first seeking God on my knees, pleading for wisdom and strength and selfless devotion to God and for His glory every day of my life? You know, if you read verse 38 and 39, I have a question for you. What did Jesus say to them when Peter said, everybody is looking for you? What can we learn from Jesus? What did Jesus do? What did Jesus say to them? What can we learn from Jesus? What did Jesus do? Wow! This is what Jesus did. After Jesus prayed, He acted. He moved. He obeyed. Go therefore, and teach them to obey. He obeyed what God wanted Him to do. Not what the people wanted Him to do, but what God wanted Him to do. And this is what God, Jesus said to His disciples. Let us go on to the next town. What? Let us go on to the next town that I may preach there also. For that is why I came to do. Wow! And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in the synagogue and casting or driving out demons. Church, 
under the pressure of entire city, forcing him to stay and to help the needy people. Depending, the whole city depending on him to heal the sick and to cast out demons. Jesus said, no. I'm not going to stay. I'm going to move on. Church, how hard it is for us to say no under much less pressure than Jesus faced that morning. Yet he knew he had a deeper purpose that required him to go on to other towns. You can see prayer and evangelism going hand in hand. What did Jesus say to them? Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Church, what can we learn from Jesus? Jesus replied, let us go. What is the Great Commission is all about? Go, therefore, and make disciples. Wow. Church, Jesus rose from his morning. You know, Jesus rose early in the morning to pray. And after he had prayed, he rose from his morning prayer. He determined to leave behind the crowd that was pressing him for the spectacular miracle, pushing him forward for fame. And Jesus said to his disciples, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. You know, Jesus added this statement, this is why I have come. This is why I have come. Preaching or sharing the gospel was his top priority. Winning souls was his priority. And Jesus' prayer life was that practical fulfillment of his mission. His communion with his father resulted in his personal commitment to his mission or his personal commitment to fulfill the great commission, which now we have. When Jesus said, this is why I have come, he revealed the purpose of his coming to this world. Jesus did not come to mainly restore health to the body, but to bring healing and life to the sin-sick soul of each and every one of us. Jesus came to this world not to achieve glory, fame and fortune, but to preach the good news of the kingdom of God to those suffering from sin. Jesus mainly came to teach the word of God. It was the purpose of his coming. He prayed and God revealed the main purpose, main purpose of his coming. That is why I have come. Jesus knew what he had come to do. He had come to preach. He had come to preach the coming of the kingdom of God. There are so many who do not know what God would have them do as Christians. So what they do is what they think God wants them to do. And they do that every day of their life. Are you one of them? And as they do that, in that way, they do not fulfill the will of God for their life that God has for them that particular day. You know, Jesus, God works with our lives one day at a time. Here, Jesus was certain of why he had come because he spent time with God in prayer. He's not only our saviour, but he's our teacher and the one we must learn from in every aspect of our lives. He had priorities. As he had priorities, we too must have priorities. Not from what our hearts or our head tells us, but from what the Lord puts in our heart when we pray earnestly and seek his, seek his will by spending time with him and reading the word. I must ask myself then, if I come to achieve something for myself or if I come to fulfill God's purposes in my life today? Is what I do a product of my own desire, even if it were a noble desire, or the product of prayer and of faith and submission to the will of God? See church, that's the question you and I got to answer each and every day. Church, what's important? You know, we usually consider whatever is the most urgent to be the most important. When we need to use the bathroom, for example, that need becomes both urgent and important. Something that must, for that moment, take priority over everything else that we might have to do. See, many things take a priority spot in our life. Sometimes it might be a movie or a television show we've been waiting to see. It might be a trip we want to take. You know, as now the government is opening its borders for travel. You know, Langkawi is becoming a tourism hub and Labuan also is becoming a tourism hub. It might be a trip we want to take or a special event we want to arrange or attend. 
Sometimes it might be something we want to buy. Maybe some new music, a pair of jeans, a computer, a car or a house. The priority might be a relationship, a job or a project. Uh, it might be even an illness, a tragedy or difficult ordeal that we might have to attend to. Prayer is the kind of priority that lies at the root of all the others, at the root of life itself. Church, prayer is like a lot like eating. If we rarely eat, our physical health will suffer. We become weak and sick. It will affect our ability to carry on the activities of life. In a similar way, if we rarely pray, our spiritual life will lack the vitality it needs to do what God has called us to do. You know, we'll approach the challenges and success of life on our own as though we are not totally dependent on God, even for life itself, when we are prayerless. You know, without prayer, we begin to take credit for the good things in our lives, chalking them up to, to, to our skill or knowledge or our wisdom and, and, and our ability to work hard to achieve that success. We begin to forget that all our skill, knowledge, wisdom and hard work are gift of God. He gave us the mind, body and the circumstances of life that enable us to have and develop those attributes. On the other hand, without prayer, we fall into fear, anxious, worry and even despair at the failures, frustration and bad events that comes, that we experience in our lives. We become unsure of God's love for us, unsure that He stands with us in our problems, that He carries us. We feel alone and afraid, doubtful about our ability to cope with what life is happening or life is heaping onto us. Prayer is the grease, we might say, or prayer is the oil that we might say that keeps the gears and wheels of our life in good working order. Without prayer, we see ourselves as alone against the world, left to fend off the storms of life on our own wits and our own brain and mind. It is in the course of prayer that we learn to see the true state of things, that we are creatures within a creation, creatures dependent on our Maker and all the other parts of the creation as, and as such. We are never alone, we are dependent on God. And it is in prayer we hear, know, understand and focus and act on our purpose in life. That is to go and make disciples of all nations. Church, let us learn from Jesus. The priority in Christian life is teaching and preaching the word of God and to pray above all else. Amen. Right now on your screen, there are some questions that I would like you to take this time to ponder on, to reflect and to bring it before God in your life in prayer. Can we do that right now, church? Church, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you who are good, gracious and kind. Thank you, Father. Lord, that you have created us in your image and you have given us this opportunity and the ability, Lord, to communicate with you and to understand, Lord, what you are saying to us. You said in your word, Lord, my sheep hears my voice and they follow me. Lord, we want to follow you. We want to hear your voice, Lord. Lord, we want to look to you today, Lord Jesus, Lord. Lord, we come and we bow our heart before you and give you the honour and praise that is due to your name. Lord, I pray, Lord, that today you will strengthen our prayer life, Lord. Lord, help us to spend time with you, Lord, uh, and to help us, Lord, to, uh, Lord, to pray more, Lord Jesus, Lord. Lord Jesus, Lord, nudge us, Lord, to pray when we are doing mindless tasks, Lord. Help us to truly know, Lord, who we are in Christ, Lord, to understand, Lord, that you always hear us, Lord. Lord, to know, Lord, your word, Lord, uh, to know your word, Lord, so that we can pray, Lord, better, Lord according to your will, Lord Jesus, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you help us to pray for the needs of others, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will help us, Lord Jesus, Lord, to understand, Lord, that I cannot evangelize without praying, Lord. And after I pray, I must go, Lord, and look for people to share the gospel. Lord, help us, Lord, to not to give excuse and reasons, Lord, the busyness, responsibility, Lord, and the pressure of life, Lord, to stop us, Lord, from praying. But give us the strength that we need, Lord, to be focused on you, Lord Jesus, Lord. We want to be people growing, Lord, in our communion, in our prayer with you, just like you, Lord Jesus, taught us, Lord, while you're on this earth as, as, a, uh, as a son of man, that you needed, Lord, prayer 
to sustain you in the work for which you have God has placed you here to do. So help us, Father, that we do the same. That our prayer life will grow. Our depth in our relationship with you will grow. That we will be rooted, Lord, in our relationship with you through prayer. Thank you, Father. You guide us. You lead us. You help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I just want to leave you with this. Prayer is a privilege that we get to experience daily. Prayer is not a responsibility that we get to do. Amen. God bless you.